My name is Leander Griggs, and I work for a secret government unit that deals with cryptids, creatures that most people don't believe exist. My team and I were sent to investigate a string of disappearances near Mount Shasta in Northern California. I'd been with the unit for over a decade, and this was just another job, or so I thought. It was early summer when we arrived in the small town of McLeod, nestled at the base of the mountain. Our unit was discreet. We dressed like hikers and carried the kind of gear you'd expect in this part of the country. Our cover story was that we were doing ecological research. I met up with my team at a diner on the edge of town. Marcus, our tech specialist, sat fiddling with a drone controller. He was lean and always looked a bit too tired. Carol, our tracker, was staring out the window, her sharp eyes constantly scanning the surroundings. She had a way of blending in, even when you were looking right at her. And then there was Eli, our muscle, a former Marine with a no-nonsense attitude. Over coffee and pancakes, we went over the plan. We'd start by talking to locals who'd seen strange things in the woods, missing hikers, odd noises, and shadows that moved in ways they shouldn't. The mountain had a reputation for strange occurrences, but this was something different. People were disappearing without a trace. Our first stop was a ranger station. Ranger Tom Mason had been in these woods for 30 years. He was skeptical at first, but opened up when he realized we weren't the typical curiosity seekers. People have been going missing for years, he said. But lately it's been worse. Experienced hikers, folks who know these woods like the back of their hand, just gone. We spent the next few days hiking the trails, talking to more people and setting up equipment. Motion sensors, cameras, and traps. It was tedious work, but necessary. At night, We'd camp out in the woods, keeping watch in shifts. One night, while on watch, I heard a noise. It was faint, like a distant echo. I stood up, trying to pinpoint its direction. It wasn't an animal sound, more like a human cry. I woke Marcus and Carol. Stay here, I said. I'll check it out. Eli joined me, his hand resting on the hilt of his knife. We moved quietly through the forest, following the sound. It led us to a small clearing. The moonlight revealed a campsite, or what was left of it. Tents torn apart, gear scattered, and a sense of chaos frozen in time. There were no bodies, but there was blood. Eli knelt down, examining the ground. This is fresh, he said. Whoever was here, it wasn't long ago. We radioed back to the others, and soon the whole team was there. Marcus set up the drone to get an aerial view while Carol looked for tracks. She found something, tracks that didn't match any animal we knew of. These are strange, she said, pointing to the ground. Almost human, but not quite. As the days went on, the disappearances weighed heavily on us. We found more campsites like the first, more blood, but never any bodies. It was as if the mountain itself had swallowed them. We were on edge, and our supplies were running low. One evening, as we were preparing to turn in, the radios crackled. It was a distress signal from a hiker we'd met earlier, a young woman named Sarah who'd been camping with friends. Her voice was panicked, barely coherent. It's here. It's coming for us. Please help! We moved fast, grabbing our gear and heading in the direction of her signal. The forest seemed different that night, the air heavier, the shadows deeper. We reached her campsite to find it in disarray, much like the others. But this time, there was a survivor. Sarah was huddled against a tree, eyes wide with terror. It's real, she whispered. It took them one by one. I tried to run, but it's fast, so fast. We tried to get more information, but she was too traumatized. Marcus stayed with her while the rest of us fanned out, searching for any sign of the creature. The forest was eerily quiet, save for the sound of our own footsteps. Then, we heard it. A rustling, followed by a low, guttural noise. We turned, weapons ready, but saw nothing. Eli took point, moving slowly, scanning the trees. Suddenly, something massive burst from the underbrush. It moved on two legs but was covered in thick fur, its eyes glowing with a predatory gleam. Eli fired 
the shots echoing through the night. The creature roared, a sound that seemed to shake the very ground. It lunged at Eli, knocking him to the ground. I shot at it, trying to draw its attention. The bullet seemed to slow it, but not stop it. Carol threw a flashbang, and the creature recoiled, disappearing back into the woods. We rushed to Eli's side. He was alive, but badly injured. We need to get him back to town, I said. Now. We moved as quickly as we could, the forest feeling like it was closing in around us. Sarah, still in shock, followed silently. When we reached the ranger station, Tom helped us get Eli stabilized. What the hell was that? he asked, eyes wide with fear. We don't know, I admitted, but it's hunting people and it's not going to stop. Eli was airlifted to a hospital and the rest of us regrouped. We had to figure out what we were dealing with. Marcus pored over the footage from the drone and our cameras. Carol studied the tracks and patterns. I spent hours going through the reports of missing persons, looking for any clue. It was Carol who made the connection. This creature, it's intelligent. It's hunting in a pattern, using the terrain to its advantage. It's almost like it's playing with us. We knew we had to trap it to find a way to stop it before more people disappeared. We set up a series of traps, using the blood from the earlier campsite as bait. It was risky, but we had no choice. That night we waited. The forest seemed to hold its breath, the silence oppressive. Hours passed, and then we heard it. The creature approached cautiously, its glowing eyes visible in the darkness. It stepped into the clearing, sniffing the air. Marcus triggered the trap, and a net shot out, entangling the creature. It thrashed and roared, but the net held. We moved in, weapons drawn. But as we got closer, the creature's eyes locked onto mine, and for a moment, I saw something almost human in them. It broke free, tearing through the net with incredible strength. We fired, but it vanished into the night. We lost it again. In the aftermath, we were left with more questions than answers. Eli recovered, but he was different, quieter. Sarah went back to her life, but she'd never be the same. As for us, we continued our work, always looking over our shoulders. The official report said nothing about a creature. It was chalked up to wild animal attacks and freak accidents. But we knew the truth. Something was out there. Something that defied explanation. Years later, I still think about that summer. About the creature with the almost human eyes. About the people who vanished. About the ones we couldn't save. The mountain keeps its secrets, and we were just visitors in its domain. My name is Vernon Harkness. I've spent the better part of my life in the service of a very secretive branch of the government, one that deals with things most people would dismiss as pure fantasy. We hunt cryptids. Most people wouldn't believe the creatures I've seen, and frankly, I wouldn't want them to. This story takes place in the depths of the Black Pines in Northern California, a place as eerie as it is beautiful. It was the beginning of summer, and the days were long and hot. I had been assigned to investigate a series of mysterious disappearances in a small logging town called Shady Creek. The locals were scared, and for good reason. Three people had vanished without a trace in the span of two months. The town's folks were convinced it was some kind of wild animal, but we knew better. I arrived in Shady Creek and met up with my team, Jenny Coleman, our tracker, and Ethan Carver, our tech specialist. Jenny was a no-nonsense kind of woman, tall and lean, with eyes that seemed to see right through you. Ethan was the brains, always tinkering with some gadget or another, and had an encyclopedic knowledge of cryptids. Let's get to it, I said as we unloaded our gear at the edge of the forest. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the promise of rain. We hiked for hours, Jenny leading the way with her keen eyes scanning the forest floor for any signs of our quarry. The first night, we set up camp near a small creek. Ethan set up motion sensors and cameras around the perimeter, while Jenny and I checked the maps. 
You think it's one of the usual suspects? Jenny asked, her voice low. Could be, I replied, but we won't know until we find it. We didn't have to wait long. Around midnight, one of Ethan's sensors went off. We grabbed our rifles and night vision goggles and moved silently through the trees towards the source of the disturbance. What we found was unsettling. A circle of flattened grass and broken branches, but no tracks leading in or out. Whatever it was, it didn't move like any animal we'd encountered before. This is odd, Ethan muttered, scanning the area with his handheld device. Yeah, I said. Keep your eyes open. The next few days were tense. We found more signs, strange claw marks on trees, patches of scorched earth, and an eerie silence that seemed to follow us. It was on the fourth day that we made our first real discovery. Jenny had found a trail of blood leading deeper into the forest. We followed it, weapons at the ready, until we came upon a small clearing. In the center was a makeshift altar covered in blood and bits of flesh. It was a gruesome sight, and I felt a chill run down my spine. Something's not right here, Jenny said, her voice barely above a whisper. Suddenly a figure burst from the trees, wild-eyed and covered in mud. It was a young man, barely more than a boy with a look of sheer terror on his face. Help me! He screamed, stumbling towards us. We rushed to him, and I could see the fear in his eyes. What happened? I asked, trying to keep my voice calm. They took them, he gasped. The others, they took them. Who took them? Jenny asked, but the boy collapsed before he could answer. We carried him back to our camp and did our best to make him comfortable. He was in shock, and it took hours before he could speak again. It was a creature, he finally said, tall, covered in fur with eyes like fire. It came out of nowhere and dragged them away. Did you see where it went? Ethan asked, leaning in. The boy nodded weakly. To the old mines deep in the forest. The mines had been abandoned for years, left to rot after a collapse that killed half the workers. It was the perfect place for something to hide. We need to check it out, I said, but we have to be careful. The next morning, we made our way to the mines. The entrance was overgrown with weeds and half buried under fallen rocks. We squeezed through the narrow opening and found ourselves in a dark, damp tunnel. Stay close, I whispered, leading the way with my flashlight. The air was thick with the smell of decay, and the sound of dripping water echoed through the darkness. We moved slowly, every step deliberate, listening for any sign of the creature. We had just reached a junction when we heard it, a low rumbling noise that sent a shiver through my bones. I signaled for the others to stop, and we waited straining our ears. Then it appeared, a hulking figure moving with unnatural speed and grace. It was covered in matted fur, its eyes glowing with a fierce malevolent light. It charged at us, and I barely had time to raise my rifle before it was upon us. We scattered, firing wildly. The creature howled in rage, its massive claws slicing through the air. I saw Jenny go down, blood spurting from a deep gash in her side. Jenny! I shouted, but she didn't respond. Ethan was frantically trying to get a clear shot, his hands shaking. I aimed and fired, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roared in pain, but didn't slow down. It turned its fiery gaze on me, and I knew we were in trouble. Fall back! I yelled, grabbing Ethan and dragging him towards the tunnel. We ran, the creature hot on our heels. I could hear its breath, ragged and furious, as it closed the distance. We burst out of the tunnel and into the blinding daylight, but the creature didn't follow. It stopped at the entrance, snarling and pacing, but it didn't come out. I glanced at Ethan, who was pale and trembling. What the hell is that thing? He whispered. I don't know, I said, but it doesn't like the light. We regrouped and did our best to tend to Jenny's wounds. She was in bad shape, but alive. We had to come up with a new plan, and fast. We need to lure it out, Ethan said. Trap it in the open where we have the advantage. How? I asked. He thought for a moment. 
we'll use the boy as bait. I didn't like the idea, but we didn't have many options. The boy agreed, his face pale but determined. He wanted to help, to end this nightmare. We set up a trap in a nearby clearing, using the boy as bait. He stood in the center, trembling but resolute, while we hid in the trees, our rifles trained on the tunnel entrance. Hours passed, and the tension was unbearable. Then we heard it. The sound of rocks shifting and a low, guttural noise. The creature emerged, its eyes fixed on the boy. It moved slowly at first, then faster, as it realized he was alone. We waited until it was in the center of the clearing, then opened fire. The creature roared in pain, but it didn't go down. It charged at the boy, who tried to run but stumbled and fell. I fired again, hitting it in the leg. It howled and turned its gaze on me. Time seemed to slow as it lunged, its claws outstretched. I rolled to the side, barely avoiding its strike. Ethan fired, hitting it in the back. It staggered but didn't fall. I grabbed my knife and lunged at it, stabbing it in the side. It roared and swung its massive arm, sending me flying. I hit the ground hard, the wind knocked out of me. The creature loomed over me, its eyes burning with fury. I thought it was the end, but then, with a final desperate effort, Ethan fired one last shot, hitting it square in the chest. The creature stumbled, its eyes dimming. It let out a final, shuddering breath and collapsed. I lay there, gasping for air, as the forest fell silent. We buried Jenny in the clearing, marking her grave with a simple wooden cross. The boy left the town, trying to put the nightmare behind him. Ethan and I reported back to our superiors, but we never got a clear answer about what the creature was. Some said it was a werewolf, others a demon. I don't know if we'll ever find out for sure. But I do know one thing. There are things in this world that defy explanation. Creatures that lurk in the shadows, waiting for their moment. And as long as they exist, we'll be there to hunt them. The aftermath of that mission lingered with us. Ethan quit the unit shortly after, unable to shake the memories of that night. As for me, I stayed on, driven by a need to understand, to protect. The Black Pines hold many secrets, and not all of them have been uncovered. But as long as I'm here, I'll keep searching, keep fighting. Because in the end, it's not about the monsters we hunt. It's about the people we save and the ones we remember. Vernon Harkness signing off until the next hunt. The night we arrived in Minerva, Ohio, the air felt colder than usual for early October. I had joined the unit a few years back, after a stint in the Marines and a short-lived career in private security. My name is Wade Langley. I didn't talk much about my job, not that I could even if I wanted to. The government kept a tight lid on our operations. Officially, we didn't exist. Unofficially, we hunted the things that went bump in the night. We had been called to Minerva for reasons still unknown to us, but that was how it usually went. You went in blind and hoped to come out seeing. The team consisted of four. Myself, Samuel Riggs, a tracker with an impeccable record, Tessa Blake, our tech expert, and our leader, Martin Royce, a seasoned operative with a stoic demeanor. We were briefed on the basics, a string of disappearances, all in the vicinity of the old Minerva quarry. We were given the coordinates, a rundown of the missing persons, and a directive to investigate, contain, and eliminate the threat. Minerva is a small town, the kind where everyone knows each other and strangers stick out. Our first stop was the local diner. It's a habit from my younger days to always start at the heart of a town. The owner, Bill Thompson, was a wealth of information, though he didn't realize it. People talked around him as if he weren't there, and we listened. Bill mentioned a local legend about the quarry, something about a creature. He chuckled it off, but there was a shadow of fear in his eyes. These stories didn't usually have a kernel of truth, but we knew better than to dismiss them outright. Our next stop was the quarry. Royce parked the van at the edge, and we descended into the basin. It was a vast, open wound in the earth, filled with jagged rocks and stagnant water. 
We split into pairs. Royce and Riggs took the east side, while Tessa and I covered the west. It didn't take long to find the first sign of trouble. A campsite, abandoned in haste. Scattered belongings, a half-eaten meal, and blood. A lot of it. Tessa, who had a knack for detail, pointed out the drag marks leading into the dark recesses of the quarry. Looks like someone didn't go willingly, she said. We followed the trail, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. It led us to a cavern, the entrance partially obscured by a landslide. The place reeked of decay, a smell that clung to your clothes and refused to let go. We entered cautiously, weapons at the ready. The deeper we went, the more oppressive the air became. And then we saw it. Bones. Not just animal bones, but human as well. Some old, some fresh. Tessa's gasp echoed in the chamber, but we pressed on. Royce had taught us well. Fear was the enemy's greatest weapon. A sound, faint but distinct, reached our ears. Something was moving in the darkness ahead. We advanced, slowly, until the light from our flashlights caught a figure. It was hunched over, tearing into what looked like a deer carcass. Royce motioned for silence. We spread out, flanking the creature. Suddenly it looked up. The thing was massive, standing nearly seven feet tall, covered in matted fur. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent intelligence, and its face, a grotesque parody of humanity, snarled at us. It moved with terrifying speed, lunging towards Tessa. She fired, the shot echoing in the cavern. The creature let out a noise more animalistic than human, but didn't stop. Riggs managed to get a shot off, hitting it in the shoulder. The creature staggered, and Royce took the opportunity to unload his rifle into it. The beast fell, crashing into the rocky floor. We approached cautiously, but it didn't move again. What the hell is this thing? Tessa whispered, her voice shaking. Royce knelt beside the body, examining it. I've seen reports of similar creatures, but nothing like this. We need to get samples and report back. We collected what we could and made our way out of the cavern. The air felt lighter, less oppressive, but the weight of what we'd found remained heavy on our shoulders. Back at the motel, we sent our findings to the headquarters. It didn't take long for the reply, Hold your position. Reinforcements en route. It was never a good sign when they sent reinforcements. We spent the next few hours in tense silence. Tessa went over the footage she'd captured. Riggs cleaned his rifle and Royce... Well, he just stared into the distance, lost in thought. As for me, I tried to get some rest, but sleep wouldn't come. It was around midnight when we heard the noise, a low rumbling like distant thunder. We grabbed our gear and headed outside. The sky was clear, but the sound grew louder. And then we saw them. More of those creatures, emerging from the forest, eyes glowing in the darkness. Get inside! Royce yelled, and we bolted for the motel. We barricaded the doors, but it wouldn't hold for long. We need to move! Now! Royce barked. We grabbed our essentials and headed for the back exit, but the creatures were already there. Royce took point, firing at the nearest one. Head for the van! He shouted. We sprinted across the parking lot creatures hot on our heels. Riggs was the first to reach the van, but as he opened the door, one of the beasts pounced on him. He screamed as it tore into him. Royce fired, killing the creature, but it was too late for Riggs. Go, 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 Royce ordered as we piled into the van. Tessa took the wheel and we sped out of the lot, the creatures in pursuit. The van rattled as they slammed into it, but we managed to outpace them. We drove through the night, not stopping until we reached the next town over. We contacted HQ, reported our losses, and waited for further instructions. It was a somber ride back to base, the weight of Riggs's death heavy on our minds. We were met with the usual debriefing, and the higher-ups promised to handle the situation in Minerva. Weeks passed and life went on. We were given a new assignment, a new location, but the memory of that night stayed with us. Riggs was given a hero's funeral, but it felt hollow. We knew the truth, and it was far from heroic. As for Minerva, the official report labeled the quarry a hazardous area, closed off to the public. The disappearances stopped, but the stories didn't. 
The townsfolk whispered about creatures in the dark, but no one dared go near the quarry again. In the end, we never found out what those creatures were. The files were classified, and we were told to forget. But some things you can't forget. Some things stay with you, haunt you. I still dream about rigs sometimes, about the quarry and those glowing eyes. I've come to terms with it, in a way. It's part of the job, they say. But some nights, when the wind howls and the shadows seem to move, I can't help but wonder if they're still out there, waiting. The government moved us from one job to the next, always chasing the unknown. We kept hunting, kept fighting. It was all we knew how to do. But every now and then, a name would come up in a briefing, a place that seemed too familiar. And I'd remember Minerva, the quarry, and the creatures that lurked within. And I'd wonder if, someday, we'd meet them again. My name is Elijah Whitaker. My friends call me Eli. I work for a secretive branch of the U.S. government. Our unit's mission is simple, but perilous. Hunt down creatures most people believe are myths. We call them cryptids. Cryptid hunting isn't something you dream of as a kid. You don't aspire to be the guy chasing Bigfoot or the Jersey Devil. But here I am. I've been doing this job for nearly a decade. It's taken me to the remote corners of the country from the dense forests of Oregon to the swamps of Louisiana. Today, I'm in the unforgiving wilderness of Montana. The place is as rugged as they come, with jagged mountains, dense forests, and isolated valleys where no one has set foot in years. We'd received reports of unexplained disappearances near the Bitterroot Mountains. Locals whispered about a creature, an animalistic figure that stalked the night, when people started going missing, our unit was called in. I arrived with my partner, Marcus Connolly, a former Marine with a penchant for dry humor and a knack for tracking. We set up our base camp at the edge of a forest. The plan was to spend a week investigating, trying to find any clues. The first few days were uneventful. We hiked through dense woods, navigated treacherous ravines, and interviewed the few locals willing to talk. No one knew much. Only rumors and second-hand stories. On the fourth day, things changed. We found a campsite deep in the forest. It looked abandoned, yet recent. There were signs of a struggle. A tent torn open, supplies scattered, and blood. Not a lot, but enough to suggest something violent had occurred. Marcus and I exchanged a look. This doesn't feel right, he muttered. Agreed, I said. We need to find out what happened here. As night fell, we set up surveillance around the campsite. It was cold, the kind of cold that seeps into your bones and makes you question your choices. Marcus kept watch while I tried to get some rest. Sleep didn't come easy. Sometime after midnight, I heard a noise, a rustling, like something moving through the underbrush. I sat up and saw Marcus, tense and alert, his rifle ready. You hear that? He whispered. I nodded, gripping my own weapon. We stayed still, listening. The noise grew closer. Then, silence. Nothing moved. No sound. Just the oppressive quiet of the forest. Marcus signaled for me to stay put and began to move toward the noise. I watched him disappear into the darkness, the beam of his flashlight cutting through the night. Minutes passed, each one feeling like an eternity. Then I heard it. A scream. Marcus's scream. I ran towards the sound, heart pounding, mind racing. I found Marcus on the ground, clutching his leg. His face was pale, eyes wide with pain and fear. There was blood, a lot of it. Something had slashed him deep. Stay with me, Marcus, I said, applying pressure to the wound. What happened? He grimaced. It was fast, Eli. Came out of nowhere. Looked like... I don't know. Never seen anything like it. I knew we had to get out of there. We were vulnerable. I helped Marcus up, supporting his weight as we stumbled back to our camp. As we moved, I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see something, anything chasing us. But there was nothing. The next morning, I radioed for backup. We couldn't continue alone, not with Marcus injured. 
They told us it would take a day for help to arrive. We just had to survive until then. We spent the day in a tense silence, both of us on edge. Every noise, every rustle of leaves set us on high alert. As night fell, I prepared for another long watch. Marcus was in no shape to keep guard. His leg was swollen, the makeshift bandage soaked with blood. I'll take the first watch, I said. He nodded, grateful. Hours passed. The forest was eerily quiet. Then I saw it. A shadow moving between the trees. It was large, humanoid, but with an animalistic gait. I raised my rifle, finger on the trigger. Who's there? I called out. No response. The shadow moved closer. I could see it more clearly now. It was covered in matted fur, its eyes glinting in the moonlight. I fired a warning shot. The creature stopped, its eyes locked on mine. Then it charged. I fired again, aiming for the center of mass. The bullets hit, but the creature barely flinched. It was on me in seconds, knocking the rifle from my hands. I fought back, using my fists and anything I could grab. It was strong, impossibly strong. Its claws raked across my chest, pain searing through me. I managed to grab a knife from my belt and plunged it into the creature's side. It howled in pain, a guttural sound that shook me to my core. It backed off, retreating into the darkness. I lay there, gasping for breath, my body aching from the struggle. Morning came, and with it, our backup. They found me covered in blood, both mine and the creature's. Marcus was barely conscious, his condition worsening. They airlifted us out, taking us to the nearest hospital. Marcus survived, but he would never walk the same again. The doctor said he was lucky to be alive. As for me, I had my own scars, physical and mental. Weeks later, after we'd both recovered, I was called into a meeting with our unit's leaders. They wanted to know what happened, what we saw. I told them everything, every detail. They listened, took notes, but their expressions gave nothing away. When I finished, they asked me one question. Do you think it's still out there? I thought about the creature, its eyes, its strength. Yes, I said. It's still out there. They nodded, thanked me, and dismissed me. I left the meeting feeling a sense of unease. We hadn't stopped it. We hadn't even come close. Months passed and life returned to a semblance of normalcy. I went on other missions, hunted other cryptids, but the memory of that night in Montana lingered. I often found myself staring into the darkness, half expecting to see those glinting eyes staring back. One evening, as I sat in my small apartment in D.C., I received a call. It was from Marcus. He sounded better, more like his old self. Eli, he said, I've been thinking. We never did find out what that thing was. No, we didn't, I replied. I've been doing some research. There are stories, legends, about creatures like the one we saw. I think we need to go back. Back to Montana? Yeah, we need to finish this. I hesitated. The thought of facing that creature again filled me with dread. But Marcus was right. We couldn't leave it unfinished. A few weeks later, we were back in the Bitterroot Mountains. This time, we were better prepared. More weapons, more supplies, more people. We weren't taking any chances. We set up a new base camp, not far from the site of our previous encounter. The forest felt different this time, more menacing. Or maybe it was just my imagination. We spent days scouring the area, looking for any signs of the creature. At night, we kept watch, always on edge. It was on the fifth night that we heard it again. The rustling, the movement in the underbrush. We were ready this time. We moved as a unit, silently advancing towards the noise. And there it was, standing at the edge of the clearing, watching us. It looked the same, but there was something different in its eyes. Something almost intelligent. I raised my rifle, aiming for its head. This ends now, I muttered. The creature lunged faster than before, but we were ready. A barrage of bullets hit it, forcing it to retreat. We followed, not letting up. It led us deeper into the forest, to a cave hidden among the rocks. 
Inside, the smell was overwhelming, the stench of decay and blood. We found the remains of its victims, scattered bones and torn flesh. But the creature was gone, vanished into the darkness. We searched the cave, but there was no sign of it. It was as if it had never been there. We left the forest that day, knowing we hadn't killed it, but hoping we'd driven it away for good. Back in D.C., we reported our findings. The higher-ups seemed satisfied, but I wasn't. The creature was still out there, somewhere, waiting. To this day, I still think about it. I still wonder what it was, where it came from. And I know, deep down, that one day I'll have to face it again. But until then, I'll keep hunting, keep searching, for answers. Because that's what I do. My name is Elijah Whitaker, and I hunt monsters. My name is Thaddeus McCreary. I was born and raised in the small town of Winslow, Arizona. It's a place that clings to you like an old jacket, worn and comfortable but impossible to shake off. After serving two tours in Afghanistan, I returned home, but the restlessness never left me. So when a government official approached me with a peculiar job offer, I couldn't resist. I joined a secret unit dedicated to hunting cryptids creatures whose existence remains unconfirmed by science. Our unit's latest assignment took us to the dense forests of northern Minnesota, specifically to a place called Whispering Pines. The local authorities had reported an unusual number of missing persons over the past year, and whispers of a creature in the woods had started to circulate. It sounded like another wild goose chase, but we were professionals. We didn't deal in legends, we dealt in facts. Our team was a motley crew. There was Jacob, a former Marine sniper with a dry sense of humor. Maria, an ex-NYPD detective with a sharp mind and a sharper tongue. And Dr. Sloan, a biologist who knew more about animal behavior than anyone I'd ever met. We called him Doc. Leading us was Agent Hastings, a no-nonsense guy who rarely spoke more than necessary. Each of us had our reasons for being there, but we shared a common goal uncover the truth behind the disappearances. We arrived at Whispering Pines on a crisp autumn morning. The town was small, barely a blip on the map, but the surrounding forest was vast and foreboding. We set up our base in an abandoned ranger station, a creaky wooden building that had seen better days. The local sheriff, an old-timer named Roy, briefed us on the situation. People been going missing for about a year now, he said his weathered face lined with concern. At first we thought it was just folks getting lost, but then we found some bodies, torn apart, like some animal got to them. But no animal I know does that kind of damage. We started our investigation by interviewing the families of the missing. Their stories were all eerily similar. Loved ones who had gone for a walk in the woods and never returned. Some had been experienced hikers, Others, not so much. The common thread was the forest. Always the forest. Jacob and I decided to scout the area where the latest body had been found. It was a gruesome scene. The body had been savaged. The kind of injuries that don't match any known predator. I had seen worse in combat, but this was different. It was calculated, almost surgical in its brutality. As we moved deeper into the woods... The trees closed in around us. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves. Jacob cracked a joke about us being in a horror movie, but his eyes were watchful, his rifle at the ready. We didn't believe in monsters, but we believed in threats, and this forest felt threatening. We set up camp as the sun dipped below the horizon. The temperature dropped quickly, and the darkness seemed to press in from all sides. We took turns keeping watch, but the night passed uneventfully. In the morning, we regrouped with the others. Maria and Doc had spent the night analyzing the latest victim's wounds and found something odd. Whatever did this has claws, Doc said, showing us magnified photos of the injuries. But the spacing and depth are unusual. This isn't a bear or a wolf. It's something else. 
we continued our search, spreading out to cover more ground. It was Jacob who found the first clue, a series of large, deep footprints leading deeper into the forest. They were unlike anything we had seen before, too big to be human, but with a distinct, almost reptilian shape. We followed them cautiously, weapons drawn. It wasn't long before we heard it, a low, menacing rumble that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. We froze, listening. The sound came again, closer this time. We moved forward slowly, the underbrush crackling under our boots. Then we saw it. The creature stood about seven feet tall, covered in dark, matted fur. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow, and its claws looked sharp enough to tear through steel. It moved with a terrifying grace, circling us as if deciding which one of us to attack first. We raised our rifles, but Hastings held up a hand, signaling us to wait. The creature seemed to lose interest and slunk back into the shadows. We exhaled collectively, the tension easing slightly. But we knew it was still out there, watching us. That night we devised a plan. We would split into two teams and try to corner the creature. Jacob and I would take the north side, while Maria and Doc covered the south. Hastings would stay at the ranger station to coordinate. It was risky, but we had no choice. The creature had to be stopped. We moved through the forest like ghosts, careful to make as little noise as possible. The darkness was almost tangible, a heavy blanket that obscured everything beyond a few feet. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves set our nerves on edge. Jacob nudged me and pointed ahead. There in a small clearing, we saw the creature again. It was hunched over something, its claws working furiously. We crept closer, our rifles trained on its massive form. Suddenly it looked up, its eyes locking onto us. There was no time to think. Jacob fired first, the shot echoing through the trees. The creature let out a hideous screech and charged. We fired in unison, the bullets tearing into its flesh. It staggered but didn't fall. Instead, it lunged at Jacob, its claws slashing through his torso. He screamed, a sound I will never forget, and collapsed. I kept firing, my vision narrowing to the monstrous shape in front of me. Finally, it retreated, disappearing into the forest once more. I rushed to Jacob's side, but it was too late. He was gone. The sight of his lifeless body filled me with a cold, hard rage. This creature had to be stopped. We regrouped at the ranger station. The atmosphere was somber, the loss of Jacob weighing heavily on us. Hastings decided that we would make our stand that night. We set up traps around the station and prepared for the creature's return. It was wounded, and we knew it would come for us. The hours dragged by, each one longer than the last. We sat in silence, our weapons ready. The wind howled through the trees, a mournful sound that only added to our unease. Then just past midnight we heard it, the unmistakable sound of something large moving through the forest. The creature burst into the clearing, its eyes blazing with fury. We opened fire, the night lit up with the muzzle flashes of our rifles. It shrieked and charged, but this time we were ready. The trap slowed it down, giving us precious seconds to aim and fire. But it wasn't enough. The creature broke through, slashing at anything in its path. Maria was the next to fall, her scream piercing the night as the creature's claws tore through her. Doc and I kept firing, but it seemed unstoppable. Then Hastings stepped forward, a grim determination on his face. He held a flare gun in his hand, a last-ditch weapon we had hoped we wouldn't need. He fired, the flare striking the creature square in the chest. It let out a final bone-chilling scream and retreated, its fur ablaze. We watched as it disappeared into the forest, the flames lighting up the night. The dawn broke, casting a pale light over the devastated clearing. We buried Jacob and Maria, simple graves marked with crosses made from fallen branches. Doc and I stood in silence, the weight of our losses heavy on our shoulders. Hastings radioed for extraction, and we were airlifted out later that day. Back in civilization, the government covered up the incident, as they always did. Officially, Jacob and Maria were killed in a tragic hunting accident. 
The creature's existence was buried, just another secret in a world full of them. But I knew the truth, and so did Hastings and Doc. The creature was still out there, lurking in the shadows of whispering pines. It was a reminder that some things are better left unexplored, some mysteries better left unsolved. We had survived, but at a great cost. And in the end, the forest had its secrets, and it wasn't willing to give them up easily. Years later, I still think about those days in Whispering Pines. The memories are like old wounds, scars that never fully heal. I still wake up some nights, heart pounding, ears straining for the sounds of the forest. And I wonder, just for a moment, if the creature remembers us too. The truth is, I'll never know. But one thing is certain. The echoes of Whispering Pines will haunt me for the rest of my days. My name is Cyrus Harlan, and I used to be a school teacher in a small town in Pennsylvania before I got recruited into this covert unit. Our job is to track down creatures that most people don't even believe exist. These aren't just myths or legends. They are real, dangerous, and our task is to handle them before they can hurt anyone else. It was late summer, and the heat had baked the small town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. This place is famous for its legends the Mothman being the most popular one. But what brought us here wasn't folklore. There had been a series of disappearances, the kind that local law enforcement couldn't handle. And that's when we got the call. My partner, Elias Thorne, and I had been working together for five years, and we had seen our fair share of strange things. But what we encountered in Point Pleasant was unlike anything we had faced before. We arrived at dusk, the sky painted in hues of orange and pink. The town seemed quiet, almost too quiet, and the air felt heavy. We checked into a small motel, the kind with flickering neon signs and a musty smell that clung to the walls. After a quick briefing, we decided to start our investigation at the last known location of the missing person, a young woman named Abby Miller. Abby had been a college student, home for the summer, She'd gone for a walk along the riverbank one evening and never returned. The locals had searched the area thoroughly, but there were no signs of a struggle, no clues left behind. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. Elias and I made our way to the riverbank, the sun dipping below the horizon. The air grew cooler, and the shadows lengthened. We walked along the path, our eyes scanning the ground for anything that might give us a lead. There was something unsettling about the place, a stillness that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Elias stopped suddenly, pointing to a patch of grass that looked trampled. Over here, he said, his voice low. We knelt down, examining the area. There were footprints, too large to be Abby's, leading away from the path and into the woods. We followed them cautiously, our hands hovering near our weapons. The tracks led us deeper into the forest, where the trees grew thicker and the light barely penetrated the canopy. After about an hour, we came across a small clearing. In the center, there was a makeshift campsite, a fire pit surrounded by stones and a few scattered belongings. But what caught my attention was the torn, bloodied piece of cloth hanging from a low branch. It was Abby's. Elias and I exchanged a grim look. This was no ordinary disappearance. We searched the campsite thoroughly, finding more signs of a struggle, broken branches, disturbed soil, and more blood. The realization hit us hard. Abby had been taken, and whatever took her was not human. We radioed back to our base, giving them our coordinates and the details of our findings. Then we continued our search, the sense of urgency growing with each passing minute. The deeper we went, the darker it got and the sounds of the forest seemed to close in around us. Suddenly, a rustling noise came from the bushes to our right. We drew our guns, moving silently towards the sound. A figure emerged, stumbling into the clearing. It was a man, his clothes torn and his face scratched. He looked at us with wild eyes, mumbling incoherently. Hey, it's okay, I said, 
lowering my gun and approaching him slowly. We're here to help. What happened to you? The man looked at me, his eyes wide with fear. It... it's out there, he stammered. It's hunting us. We got him to sit down and gave him some water. His name was Gary, a local hiker who had been camping in the woods when he was attacked. He described a creature, tall and gaunt, with glowing eyes and long claws. It had taken Abby and chased him, but he had managed to escape. Gary's description matched the reports we had received about other sightings in the area. This was no ordinary animal. It was something far more sinister. We knew we had to act fast if we were going to find Abby and stop this creature. Leaving Gary with our emergency supplies and instructions to stay put, Elias and I pressed on. The forest seemed to close in around us, the darkness becoming almost tangible. We moved cautiously, every sound amplified in the silence. Then we heard it, a low, guttural sound that sent a chill down my spine. We followed the noise, our guns drawn and our senses on high alert. The trees parted to reveal a cave entrance, partially hidden by overgrown vines and foliage. The sound grew louder, echoing from within. Taking a deep breath, we entered the cave, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The air inside was damp and musty, the floor uneven and slippery. We moved slowly, the beam of our lights dancing over the walls. Then we saw it, a shadowy figure at the far end of the cave. It turned towards us, its eyes glowing in the darkness. Elias fired a shot, but the creature moved with incredible speed, darting out of sight. We advanced cautiously the tension palpable. As we rounded a corner, we found ourselves in a larger chamber. There, lying on the ground, was Abby. She was unconscious but alive, her clothes torn and dirty. I rushed to her side, checking her pulse. She's alive, I said, relief washing over me. Elias kept his gun trained on the shadows, his eyes scanning the darkness. We need to get her out of here, he said, his voice steady. We lifted Abby carefully, moving as quickly as we could without risking her safety. The creature was still out there, and we knew it wouldn't let us leave without a fight. As we made our way back through the cave, we heard it again, the same guttural noise, closer this time. It lunged at us from the darkness, its claws raking the air inches from my face. Elias fired again, the shot echoing through the cave. The creature recoiled, letting out a deafening scream. We didn't wait to see if it was hurt. We ran, Abby in my arms, Elias covering our retreat. We burst out of the cave into the night, the cool air hitting our faces. We didn't stop running until we reached the clearing where we had left Gary. He was gone, his supplies scattered and signs of a struggle evident. We need to get to the town, Elias said, urgency in his voice. We made our way back to the riverbank where we had parked our vehicle. The drive back to town was tense, our eyes constantly scanning the darkness for any sign of the creature. We arrived at the motel and called for an emergency evacuation. Within minutes, a helicopter arrived, and we got Abby on board, her condition stable but critical. As we flew back to our base, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had only just begun to understand the danger lurking in those woods. Abby survived, but others might not be so lucky. The creature was still out there, and it was only a matter of time before it struck again. Back at the base, we debriefed with our superiors, providing every detail of our encounter. They assured us that a team would be sent to investigate further, but I knew this wasn't the end. The creature was still out there, and we had barely scratched the surface of its true nature. Days turned into weeks, and the memories of that night haunted me. We had saved Abby but at a great cost. Gary was still missing, and the thought of what might have happened to him kept me up at night. The creature had evaded capture, and the reports of its sightings continued to trickle in. Point Pleasant remained a place of mystery and fear, its legends now intertwined with the very real danger that lurked in its woods. We had done our job, but the sense of unease never left me. There are things in this world that defy explanation, creatures that exist beyond the realm of our understanding. As for me, I returned to my work with a renewed sense of purpose.
the world is full of darkness, but there are also those of us who stand ready to face it. We are the ones who venture into the unknown, who confront the things that go bump in the night. And though the battle is never truly won, we fight on, because sometimes the difference between life and death is knowing what's out there and being prepared to face it. Elias and I remain partners, our bond forged in the fires of countless battles. We continue our work, always vigilant, always ready. The world is a strange and dangerous place, but we are the line that holds the darkness at bay. And as long as we stand, there is hope. My name is Elwood Crane, and I work for a special unit in the government. We're not exactly well known, nor do we seek the spotlight. Our task is to investigate and, if necessary, eliminate cryptids, those mysterious creatures of folklore that everyone else dismisses as myth. I was recruited straight out of the Marines, my skills with reconnaissance and firearms making me a good fit for the job. It was a Tuesday, I think. No, it was a Wednesday. Those little details blur after a while. Anyway, it started like any other day. I got up at dawn, made a strong pot of coffee, and checked my gear. A couple of Berettas, a hunting knife, and a rifle. It's not like I expected a firefight every day, but you never knew what you'd run into. My colleague, Graham Thurber, and I were assigned to investigate a series of disappearances in a small town nestled in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. They were the kind of cases that don't make the headlines but cause a ripple in the community. A teenager vanishing after a late-night drive, a fisherman not returning from his morning trip, and a hiker disappearing without a trace. The locals whispered about the Jersey Devil, but our intel suggested something else. Graham and I arrived in town and immediately noticed the unease. People stayed indoors and those who ventured out kept their heads down. We checked into a small motel, the kind with flickering neon lights and creaky beds. It was run by an elderly couple who eyed us warily. Strangers around these parts usually find trouble, the old man said. His name was Walter, and his eyes had seen too much. Trouble finds us whether we look for it or not, Graham replied. He had a way of making grim statements sound almost cheerful. We started our investigation by talking to the local sheriff, a man named Ed Walker. He was in his late forties, grizzled, and clearly out of his depth with these disappearances. You don't believe in the Jersey Devil, do you? He asked, almost hopeful. I believe in finding answers, I replied. Tell us about the latest disappearance. Sheriff Walker leaned back in his chair, rubbing his temples. Clara Daniels, 17, went out for a drive three nights ago. Her car was found abandoned on the side of Route 72. No signs of struggle, just gone. We decided to start where Clara's car was found. The sun was setting, casting long shadows over the dense pine forest. As we examined the area, something caught my eye. Deep scratches on a tree about eight feet off the ground. Graham, take a look at this, I said, pointing to the marks. He whistled low. That's no bear. The pine barrens were dense and disorienting. We ventured deeper, our flashlights casting eerie beams through the underbrush. Every sound seemed amplified, the crunch of leaves underfoot, the distant hoot of an owl, the rustling of unseen creatures. Feels like we're being watched, Graham muttered. Stay sharp, I replied, my hand instinctively moving to my holstered Beretta. We followed a faint trail that led us to an old cabin, long abandoned, its roof was caved in and the windows were shattered. Inside, we found more scratches, this time on the floorboards and a disturbing amount of dried blood. Something or someone made this their hunting ground, I said. Graham nodded, his face grim. We need to call for backup. Our radios crackled with static. No signal. Of course, Graham sighed. Well... We better head back to town and report this. As we turned to leave, a low guttural sound, no, not guttural, more like a rumble came from the trees. We froze, straining to see in the dim light. Suddenly, 
a dark figure burst from the underbrush, slamming into Graham and knocking him to the ground. I fired a shot, but the thing moved too fast. It was on all fours, with fur matted and eyes glowing an unnatural yellow. I couldn't get a clear shot without risking hitting Graham. Graham, get up, I shouted, trying to aim. Graham rolled to his feet, pulling out his knife. He slashed at the creature, catching it across the snout. It reared back, giving me the chance to fire again. This time the bullet found its mark, and the creature howled in pain before retreating into the darkness. We need to follow it, Graham said, panting. Not without more firepower, I countered. Let's get back and regroup. Reluctantly, Graham agreed. We made our way back to the car, our senses on high alert. The drive back to town was tense, neither of us speaking much. We went straight to the sheriff's office where Ed Walker was waiting. What the hell happened to you two? He asked, eyes wide. We found your creature, Graham said, and it's not the Jersey Devil. We called in reinforcements. Two more agents, Davis and Martinez, both seasoned and reliable. We briefed them on what we had encountered and formulated a plan. This time, we would be better prepared. At dawn, we returned to the cabin, armed to the teeth. The forest was eerily silent, as if it knew something was coming. We spread out, moving cautiously through the trees. It wasn't long before we found fresh tracks, large, clawed, and heading deeper into the woods. We followed them to a cave, hidden behind thick underbrush. This has to be its lair, Davis said, his voice barely above a whisper. Stay close and stay sharp, I ordered. We entered the cave, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The smell hit us first, a rancid stench of decay and blood. The cave opened up into a larger chamber and there we saw it. The creature was hunched over, feasting on something, someone. Clara Daniel's lifeless eyes stared back at us, and beside her another body, too decomposed to identify. Take it down, I shouted. We opened fire, bullets ripping through the air. The creature roared in pain, but it didn't go down easy. It charged at us, knocking Davis to the ground. Martinez and I kept firing, aiming for its head. Finally it collapsed, breathing its last. We approached cautiously, making sure it was truly dead. Let's get these bodies out of here, I said my voice heavy with the weight of what we had seen. Back in town, we handed over the bodies to the sheriff. The locals would finally have some closure, though the scars would remain. You think there are more of these things out there? Graham asked as we packed up our gear. Maybe, I replied. But that's a question for another day. The reports were filed, the incident classified, and life went on. For the people of that small town, the Pine Barrens would always hold a dark memory. For me and Graham, it was just another job, another creature in a long line of things that shouldn't exist but did. I still think about Clara Daniels and the others who didn't make it. Each case leaves a mark, a reminder of the things lurking in the shadows of our world. But it's my job to keep those shadows at bay, to make sure the stories remain just that, stories. As for the creature, the government classified it as an unknown cryptid, a nameless terror that we had faced and defeated. But deep down, I knew there were more out there waiting, and we would be ready. My name is Tobias Egan, and I work for a unit that officially doesn't exist. We're a secret cryptid hunting group funded and operated by the U.S. government. The public doesn't know we exist, and that's probably for the best. This happened last summer, in the mountains of Montana, a place called Beartooth Wilderness. Beautiful, rugged terrain, the kind that makes you feel alive, even as it tries to kill you. We got the call in the dead of night. Something had been picking off hikers. The local authorities had no leads, and they were starting to think it wasn't something they could handle. So they called us. My team, a mix of ex-military biologists and survivalists, was dispatched with little information and even less hope. 
I remember thinking how this job would be just another day at the office. Tracking, identifying, and eliminating a cryptid was our bread and butter. How wrong I was. Our first day was spent gathering intel from the local rangers. They were tight-lipped, clearly spooked. People go missing up there, one of them said. But not like this. It's different this time. Blood trails leading nowhere, gear left behind like they just vanished. His eyes were wide, haunted. Something's hunting up there, and it ain't no bear. We set up camp at the trailhead, a base of operations. I had a team of six. Maria, our tracker, Hank, our weapons specialist, Dr. Laura Pine, a biologist, Jake, our survival expert, and Rob, our tech guy. We didn't waste time. At dawn, we headed into the mountains. By midday, we found our first clue, a shredded backpack smeared with blood. It was a mess of nylon and gore, the kind of sight you don't forget. Looks like something big got them, Maria muttered, examining the tears. Claws, maybe definitely not human. We pushed on, the tension thick. It was Maria who found the next clue, a torn piece of clothing snagged on a branch. She stopped, crouching low. This is fresh. Whatever did this, it's close. The first night, we camped in a small clearing. We took turns on watch, the fire casting long shadows. I was up, my senses on high alert. It was around midnight when I heard it, a rustling, then a low, heavy breathing, like a large animal. I woke Hank, who silently grabbed his rifle. Over there, I whispered, pointing to the edge of our camp. We moved slowly, carefully, trying to catch sight of whatever was out there. But there was nothing, just the dark and the oppressive silence. We stayed up the rest of the night, but whatever had been there, it didn't come back. The next morning, we found tracks, Huge, clawed tracks, leading deeper into the wilderness. This isn't like any animal I know, Laura said, her voice a mix of fear and excitement. It's not in any of the books. We followed the tracks for miles, the terrain growing more treacherous. We found more signs, half-eaten carcasses of deer, shredded as if by some monstrous force. The deeper we went, the more we felt like we were being watched. It was the third day when things went south. We stumbled upon an old cabin, half-rotted and abandoned. Inside, we found signs of a struggle. Blood on the floor, deep gashes in the wood. And then, we found the body. Or what was left of it. Torn apart, barely recognizable as human. Hank turned away, cursing under his breath. Laura looked pale, her hands shaking. We need to go. Jake said, his voice steady but his eyes betraying his fear. This thing, whatever it is, it's hunting us. But we couldn't leave. Not yet. We had to find it. Stop it. That's what we were here for. That night we set traps around our camp. It was a tense, quiet evening, everyone on edge. Around midnight we heard it again. That rustling, that heavy breathing. This time it was closer much closer. Everyone up, I whispered, and we all grabbed our weapons. We formed a tight circle, backs to the fire. The noise grew louder, coming from all sides. We were surrounded. Then it attacked, a blur of movement, a flash of claws. It was huge, covered in matted fur, eyes glowing in the firelight. It moved like nothing I'd ever seen, fast and silent. It hit Hank first, knocking him to the ground. He screamed, a short, sharp sound that cut off abruptly. We fired, bullets tearing through the night. The creature roared, a sound that shook the ground beneath our feet. It lunged again, this time at Maria. She went down hard, her knife useless against its mass. I grabbed a flare, lighting it and throwing it at the creature. It recoiled, the light seeming to hurt it. In that brief moment, I saw its face a twisted, nightmarish visage, something out of a horror film. But this was real. We kept firing, driving it back. Finally, it retreated into the darkness, leaving us with our dead. Hank and Maria were gone, their bodies broken and bloodied. We were shaken, but we had no choice. We had to keep moving. 
We buried Hank and Maria, marking their graves with stones. There was no time for mourning. We pressed on, the tracks leading us higher into the mountains. The air grew thin, the trees sparse. We were getting close. Two days later we found its lair, a cave hidden behind a waterfall. The air was thick with the stench of decay. Inside we found more bodies, hikers, campers, all torn apart. And then we saw it, sleeping, if you could call it that, in the back of the cave. The creature. We approached slowly, weapons drawn. I signaled to Laura and Jake to flank it while Rob and I took point. We needed to be quick, decisive. But things rarely go as planned. As we moved in, the creature stirred. Its eyes snapped open, and it leapt to its feet with a speed that defied its size. It charged at us, and we opened fire. The cave echoed with the sound of gunfire and the creature's enraged roars. It was chaos. Rob went down first, a swipe from the creature's claws sending him sprawling. Laura screamed, firing her rifle until it clicked empty. Jake threw a grenade, the explosion deafening in the confined space. When the smoke cleared, the creature was gone. The cave was a wreck, bodies and debris everywhere. We were alive, but barely. Rob was dead. Laura wounded. Jake and I were the only ones still standing. We stumbled out of the cave half-dazed. There was nothing more we could do. The creature was still out there, but we had no strength left to pursue it. We radioed for extraction, and a chopper picked us up the next morning. Back at base, we were debriefed. The higher-ups weren't happy. We'd lost three good people and the creature was still at large. But we'd done our job as best we could. In the end, they decided to cordon off the area, declare it a protected wilderness. No one in, no one out. They couldn't risk another encounter. As for us, we were reassigned, sent to different parts of the country. The unit carried on, but we were changed, haunted. I still think about that creature, about what it was and where it came from. I'll never know for sure, but one thing's certain. There are things out there in the dark places of the world that defy explanation. Things that hunt and kill, and sometimes we hunt them back. I was sitting on my porch sipping a cold beer, watching the last light of the day disappear behind the mountains. I was thinking about my job, about the things I'd seen. My name is Gabriel Thorne, and I work for a cryptid hunting unit funded by the U.S. government. It's not the kind of job you talk about at dinner parties, but it pays well, and it keeps life interesting. My partner Willard Lawson and I had been assigned to investigate a series of disappearances in the dense forests of northern Idaho. The locals whispered about an old legend, something they called the Stalker. They said it was an ancient creature that prowled the woods, taking people who wandered too far from the beaten path. The morning we left for Idaho, I met Willard at the airstrip. He was already loading our gear into the chopper. Willard was a big guy, built like a linebacker, with a no-nonsense attitude and a dry sense of humor. He handed me a thermos of coffee as I approached. Ready for another wild goose chase? He asked, a grin on his face. Always, I replied, taking a swig of the coffee. It was strong and bitter, just the way I liked it. The flight was uneventful, the kind that gives you too much time to think. By the time we landed in the small town of Pinehurst, I was itching to get into the field. The town was quiet, almost eerily so. We checked into a small motel, the kind with flickering neon signs and peeling paint, and set up our equipment. That night we met with the local sheriff, a grizzled old man named Hank Monroe. He had the look of someone who'd seen too much and didn't care to see anymore. People have been going missing for years, Hank said, nursing a whiskey in the corner of the dimly lit bar. But it's gotten worse lately. Good folks, just up and disappearing without a trace. What do you think it is? Willard asked, leaning back in his chair. Hank shook his head. I don't know. Some say it's a bear. Others say it's something else. Something unnatural. 
We spent the next few days interviewing locals and exploring the forest. The more we heard, the more I began to believe that there was something out there, something beyond our understanding. The stories were too consistent, the fear too real. One evening we set up camp deep in the woods, determined to find answers. We had trail cameras, motion sensors, and enough firepower to take down a small army. As the sun set, the forest came alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures. It was peaceful, in a way, but there was an underlying tension, a sense that we were being watched. Around midnight, the first alarm went off. A motion sensor had detected movement near the edge of our camp. Willard and I grabbed our rifles and moved silently through the trees. The night was pitch black, the kind of darkness that plays tricks on your eyes. We found the source of the disturbance, a deer carcass, torn apart and still bleeding. But what struck me was the precision of the wounds. They weren't the ragged tears of a bear or a wolf. They were clean, almost surgical. Something's not right, Willard muttered, his voice barely audible. We spent the next few hours on high alert, but nothing else happened. As dawn broke, we decided to check the trail cameras. What we found sent chills down my spine. The footage showed a large, shadowy figure moving through the trees, barely visible but undeniably there. We followed the trail, deeper into the forest. The trees grew denser, the air colder. It felt like we were stepping into another world, a place untouched by time. After a few hours we stumbled upon a clearing. In the center was a cave, its entrance hidden by thick underbrush. We ventured inside, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The cave was deep, winding through the earth like a labyrinth. The air was damp and cold, the kind that seeps into your bones. We found remnants of campfires, old and new, and signs of a struggle. Then we found the bodies. They were arranged in a circle, their faces twisted in terror. Some were old, little more than skeletons, while others were fresh, their skin still pale and lifeless. It was a macabre display, a monument to whatever horror dwelled in these woods. Willard and I exchanged a grim look. We knew we had to get out of there, but as we turned to leave we heard a sound, a low, guttural sound that echoed through the cave. We raised our rifles, our hearts pounding in our chests. The creature stepped into the light. It was massive, towering over us, its body covered in matted fur. Its eyes glowed with an unnatural light and its teeth were sharp and gleaming. It didn't speak, didn't make a sound, but the message was clear. We were not welcome here. We opened fire, the sound deafening in the confined space. The bullets seemed to have little effect, barely slowing it down. It lunged at Willard, its claws slashing through his chest. He fell to the ground, blood pouring from the wounds. I fired again and again, but the creature kept coming. I knew we couldn't kill it, but I had to try. It was on me in an instant, its claws tearing into my flesh. The pain was excruciating, but I managed to pull the trigger one last time. The creature recoiled, giving me a chance to crawl away. I grabbed Willard, dragging him towards the entrance. He was barely conscious, his breathing ragged. We made it outside, the sunlight blinding us. The creature didn't follow staying within the shadows of the cave. I called for help, my voice hoarse and desperate. A search team arrived within hours, but it was too late for Willard. He died in the helicopter, his blood staining the floor. They never found the creature. The cave was empty when they returned, the bodies gone. The locals still talk about the stalker, but no one dares to venture into those woods. I left the unit shortly after that, unable to shake the memories of that night. I still have nightmares, images of those glowing eyes and sharp teeth haunting me. I know I'll never be the same again, but I also know that some things are best left undiscovered. The government covered up the incident, as they always do. Officially, Willard's death was attributed to a bear attack, a tragic accident. But I know the truth, and I carry the scars to prove it. The stalker is still out there, somewhere in those dark woods, waiting. And I know it will never stop. 
I moved to a small town in Montana, far away from the memories of that night. I bought a cabin near a lake, where the air is clean and the nights are quiet. It's a simple life, but it's enough. I still keep a rifle by my bed, just in case. Sometimes, when the wind is just right, I think I hear something in the distance, a low sound that sends a shiver down my spine. I tell myself, it's just the wind, but deep down I know the truth. The stalker is still out there, and it always will be. <laughs>